Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabina, for a very lovely introduction. In fact, the packaging is better than the meat. Um, no. I'm, <laughs> after, after seeing Nina's presentation about cosmology and models of uh, dark matter, dark well, just dark matter and galaxy formation, this is going to be a rather provincial presentation because I will restrict my attention to the galaxy in addition to torture testing your English for those of you for whom English is not a first language. Um, this is a short presentation, so I'll try and hit a few highlights. My real goal here is not so much to teach you anything, because I very seldom manage to do that to, to anyone, but perhaps to provoke you uh, with some ideas that might get you thinking about things. My day job is to look for, uh, look for aliens, look for other intelligence that's at least as clever as you find here in San Francisco. And of course, you can do that by just driving out of the city. But let me just consider why we think they might be out there. How many of you think the aliens are out there, by the way? OK, and how many of you think mm, probably not? OK, well, what's the point? Oh, maybe Jeanette. OK, I was going to say, if you all think they're out there, there's really not much point. We might as well just go have another cup of coffee. But if you were to grab the next 10 astronomers off the streets of Munich and ask them, do you think there are aliens out there? I bet 9 out of the 10 would say yes. But it's not because we found them, because we haven't found any life, any life, dead or alive, to quote the last president, dead or alive, beyond Earth. Microbes, nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, But I don't think that means we're alone. This is the universe as it was understood 300 years ago. It was basically the solar system. This is still the universe to a lot of people. But there were a lot of people who spent a lot of time thinking about how the solar system was put together. And working that out really was maybe one of the great accomplishments of the Renaissance. Okay. Uh, today, astronomers, in general, don't spend much time on the solar system. That's their own backyard. They're more interested in other people's backyards. So they study at least the galaxy. This is a, not a picture of our galaxy, because we don't have any cameras up there where you could make this kind of picture. But this is more or less what it would look like. And Nina's already shown you pictures of what our galaxy would look like when you simulate it in a computer. It's a big thing, 100,000 light years across. For those of you who don't know what a light year is, that's you know, the amount of distance covered by light in one year. It's about 10 trillion kilometers, which is about what I have on my Honda. OK, so it's about 100,000 light years across, a few hundred thousand million stars. Our solar system is out you know, in the boondocks there. That's what it looks like from the side. This is a real photo, of course. These soft lights throw light everywhere. So if you can't see the slides, I just recommend that you just close your eyes and you know, think of England or something like that. Now, the point is, of course, if there's life out there, it's not uh, likely to be on a star. That's entirely too toasty. It's going to be on a planet. So the big question, and this has been a question in astronomy for a long time, is how many of these several hundred billion stars in our galaxy actually have planets? Now, when I was a kid, which was just before the uh, start of the Crimean War, I would go to the local uh, planetaria, and they would tell you, well, look, uh, yeah, you know, planets could be very rare. The planets in our solar system could be the result of some sort of cosmic fender bender, some, some accident that produced these planets. And if that were true, then indeed, that's better, isn't it? Is that better? Yes. That, if that were true, then, in fact, you would be perhaps justified in assuming you are the brightest things in the universe, OK? But it's not true. It turns out we began to find planets around other normal stars in 1995, so that's not so long ago, fewer than 20 years. We now have found hundreds, actually, if you count candidates. We found thousands of stars that have planets. That's not so interesting. The really interesting thing is what fraction of stars have planets. And papers published just this year, mostly by European workers, by the way, uh, suggests that essentially 70 or 80 percent of all stars have planets. Now, to an astronomer, 70 or 80 percent is the same as all, right? There's no difference, right? In astronomy, pi is equal to one. I mean, so <laughs> given that all of them have planets, that means the number of planets, because planets are like kittens. You don't just get one, you get a bunch. The number of planets in the galaxy is like a trillion, plus or minus two. OK, so that's a big number. Right. So it's thoroughly justified to say, look, most of those planets are going to be uninteresting. They're going to be sterile. They're going to be like Neptune or Mercury or even Venus. You know, OK, you know, you know, to look at them through a telescope, but not really very interesting for biology. But in a trillion planets, not all those lottery tickets could be losers, not all of them. Okay, And as we've already heard, 
our galaxy is just one of, well, more than 100 billion that we could see, right? And, and keep in mind, the ones we can see represent only a very tiny fraction, most likely, a very tiny fraction of the real cosmos. In fact, the real cosmos might be infinite, okay? So to think this is the only place in all of this enormous cosmos where something interesting is happening, namely the development not just of life but intelligent life, to believe that means that you believe in miracles. Okay, and that's okay, but astronomy has 500 years worth of track record that shows every time you thought you were a miracle, you were wrong. Okay, so astronomers are very, very leery about believing in miracles. That's why we think they're out there. The universe is big. That's just the number of stars that we can see with our telescopes. And as I just told you, that's only a small sample. Okay, and uh, I just said that. Okay, so that's why we think they're out there. It's just a lot of real estate. Now, how do we find them? This is the way you would do it 100 years ago. This is Percy Lowell. Percy Lowell was born into a very wealthy Boston family. He didn't really have to worry about what he was going to do when he grew up because he didn't have to do anything. But he, in fact, worked in the family business for a while. He wanted to, uh, what he really wanted to do was be an astronomer. He went to Harvard, studied mathematics, which is what uh, people would do if they wanted to be astronomers. Uh, he, is, he is said to have been the, the, I don't know if Joe will take offense at this, that he is said to have been the smartest uh, student that Harvard ever had. <laughs> Mind you, it's only Harvard, so maybe, you know, don't mean. But in any case, so, but rather than taking a, a job, uh, you know, as an astronomer at some third grade university hoping to get tenure, he just said, look, I've got money. I'll build my own observatory. I'll define my own job, which is what he did. This was the observatory that he built in Flagstaff, Arizona, not because of the cuisine, but because Flagstaff had a very stable atmosphere. The viewing was good. And here he is in about 1900 looking through this 24-inch refractor at Mars. Now, in 1900, you know, you would put on a suit and a tie to sit alone all night in a dark dome looking at Mars. Probably wouldn't do that today. Uh, his wife, Constance, who was considerably younger, uh, didn't find this all that interesting. We don't have photos of what she was doing in the evenings, but it wasn't this. Okay, so there's Lowell. Now, he, he was looking at Mars. He had been influenced by an Italian astronomer, the director of the Milan Observatory, or an observatory in Milan, uh, by the name of Scaparelli, who, when he looked at Mars, thought he saw lines crisscrossing the, the, the surface of our little ruddy buddy there. And Lowell could see these, too. And he wrote three books about this. The canals on Mars, you've all heard this, right? The canals on Mars. Now, you know, one question you might ask right away, why were the Martians busy with all these <laughs> civil engineering projects trenching their planet, all these shovel-ready projects? Why were they doing that, right? And the answer was, Lowell had the answer. This is a smart guy. He said, look, the answer is Mars is drying out, which it is, by the way. Uh, and they needed to bring water from the only places where they had water, which are the polar caps, bring it down to the uh, equatorial regions where they grew their Brussels sprouts or whatever it was that they dined on. Okay. He wrote three books about this. He was a good writer. He was a good speaker. He was good at everything, actually, except he was wrong about Mars because these canals don't exist. They don't exist. This is a contemporary illustration, 1908, I think this one is, showing the Martians at a cocktail party, apparently. So here you see the Martians. A couple of things worth noting. You note that the females, you can tell the females because they wear bows in their hair and they have long eyelashes. Uh, but basically, you can tell, well, the other thing you can see here is that they look like you, right? I mean, really. They're very anthropomorphic, right? I mean, they, they're upright. They have, you know, four appendages. The fingers look a little bit long, but that might help if you play the recorder. I mean, these guys, if they moved in next door, right, uh, yeah, I mean, you talk about them for a while, but pretty soon you'd invite them over for dinner. This is a recurrent theme in all of science fiction. The aliens very often look like us. I'll get back to that. Okay. Well... When we finally went to Mars, it was a little disappointing. Some of you are old enough to remember when this photo was made. It was 1976. And NASA had sent two landers to the rusty, dusty surface of Mars. They plopped down onto the surface, and then they opened up the shutters of their cameras. And that was a very exciting time, because nobody knew what they were going to see. Nobody had seen the surface of Mars before. I don't know, it could be little green guys waving, hi, welcome to Mars. It could have been plants. It could have been, you know, I don't know, strange creatures. This is what they saw. And it didn't change. They made photos every day for months and months and months. The picture never changed. Really boring, OK? And people were very disappointed. It looks like it's dead, Jim. It's dead, OK? 
Now, there was a guy down at Caltech, a guy by the name Norm Horowitz, who was on the Viking landing team, and he, or lander team, and he said, look, you know, it could be that there is life on Mars. It just looks like rocks. On the other hand, what look like rocks in this photo could be rocks. And in fact, they are rocks. Okay, so this was very disappointing, but I want to point out that Mars later showed that maybe it isn't quite so dead. This is, this is a photograph made from an orbiter, and you see this kind of thing here that looks like what? Looks like a stream bed. Looks like there was water that ran out of there, right down onto the plains here. Maybe there was a time when Mars was a better place for life, and we think that there was. There was a big story in 1996, the biggest science news story of the year, was this rock. This is a rock that comes from Mars. So it's about the size of a baked potato, not quite the same texture. We know this came from Mars. There's no controversy about that. There's a little brass plate on the bottom that says, made on Mars. We know that came from Mars, okay? And when some scientists opened this up, looked at it under a microscope and so forth, they saw interesting structures that looked like Martians, microbial Martians, right? So this, is, this, this thing's actually rather small compared to even most bacteria. But there it goes, little Rodney here. The question is, is that a Martian from four billion years ago got frozen in this planet and fossilized or not? And the claim was it was. This was a very big story, right? For three days running, this was the lead story in the New York Times in font so large, you could read it from low-flying aircraft. This was a big story, okay? But it's very controversial, and actually very few people in the astrobiology community believe that this was really a Martian. But in any case, we're still looking for life on Mars. It may be there. What you really need to do is send Bruce Willis to Mars, drill down a couple of hundred feet, and look at what may be wet rock down there and find it. Here's the Curiosity rover and it's uh, looking for things on Mars that might tell you that once it was a better place for life. This is a recent photo from Curiosity. You might say, well, gosh, I can see this in Arizona, which you can, but the point is th you can see it not just in Arizona, but also on Mars. This looks like it was a place where water once ran. Billions of years ago, but there was once water on the surface of Mars. And whenever you have water, you gotta say, you know, could be some chemistry, could be some biochemistry, maybe life got started on Mars. Okay, this is another, I just throw this up. This is another photo from an orbiter. This is Mars. This is the side of a crater. You see these brown streaks. These brown streaks appear in the summer, the Martian summer, and they grow every day. They get a little longer. And this could be, not, not for sure, but this could be water just under the surface, you know, a few centimeters under the surface, ice that's melted during the Martian summer. In which case, maybe the best way to find life on Mars is to send a rover that can somehow land on the side of a crater wall have it scoop up some of that wet dirt, if it really is wet dirt, and look at it under a microscope, and maybe you'll see little wiggly Martians. It would be very interesting to find life on Mars. You might say, pond scum on Mars? I've got pond scum in my bathtub. Why do I have to spend hundreds of millions of my tax dollars to find pond scum on Mars? And the answer is, if you did, you would say, you know, life's not a miracle. Next planet out also has life. It's all over the place. It's like an infection. It's everywhere. That's not the only place you might find life on Mars, uh, life. There are other indications. This is a European result. There may be methane on, uh, coming out of the, uh, the cracks of the surface of Mars due to uh, microbes. I won't, I won't dwell on that. This is another place where we might find life. There are six other places besides Mars in our own solar system where there might be life. This is a moon of Saturn, Titan. When you look at it this way, you don't see much. It looks like a tennis ball. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's rather bigger than our own moon but it has an atmosphere of smog. So this is Los Angeles on Titan, but with radar you can see underneath that, and when you do, you see a landscape that looks like this. These flat areas, that's what the radar is telling you, these are lakes, lakes, lakes on a moon of Saturn. Now, of course, being Saturn, it's pretty far from the sun, it's pretty cold. You know, daytime temperatures there are about minus 200 degrees. I never remember whether that's centigrade or Fahrenheit, but minus 200, what do you care? Okay, here, here's a close-up of one of those lakes. These things are big. That's the same as, you know, Lake Erie or something. They're big, okay. They're filled with liquid natural gas, right? The same stuff you used to cook your breakfast this morning, probably. Now, that's a hydrocarbon. I mean, this is carbon chemistry, and it's been, it's been sitting there for four billion years, so maybe something is cooked up there. And one proposal by a guy at uh, a university in, in the state of Washington is to send a robotic ship. Let's do some more exploration the way we used to do it in the 17th century with ships, right? So a robotic ship, there it is, it looks like the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, a robotic ship that goes to one of these lakes on Titan and looks around for some sort of microbial life. I think that's a great idea. 
because it has romance. It's not just exploration, it has romance. Another place where you might find life, this is a moon of Jupiter, this is Europa, that's ice. But underneath that ice, and maybe not very far underneath that ice, is liquid water. And it's been sitting there for four billion years. It could be sterile, but that would be not just disappointing, but unusual. Here's another moon of Saturn, Enceladus. This is a re relatively recent result, past couple of years. Geysers, water ice geysers shooting out of uh, cracks in the surface of this moon, which means there's liquid water underneath the surface. Again, where there's liquid water, maybe there's life. What about intelligent life? Well, more than a half century ago, this antenna, which is in West Virginia, this is a photo I made last summer, it's still there. It was used by this guy, Frank Drake, and what he did is, if you see Santa Cruz, so Nina says her office is not near his, but anyhow, Frank used this antenna, he pointed it in the direction of two nearby star systems, hoping to eavesdrop, eavesdrop, Lauster Fink in Dutch, I don't know what it is in German, what's eavesdrop? Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah, to, to, to sort of listen in on somebody else's conversation. Okay, well, nobody knows, all right. It's just an indication that, you know, 1% of this is getting through, which is all right. It's better than my average. Okay, well, Frank Drake used this antenna, pointed at a couple of nearby stars, hoping to, hoping to hear radio signals from aliens. That's what started this whole field where I'm now involved. And this is a photo I made of our own uh, antennas. These are up in a place called Hat Creek, California. I'm sure many of you, very few of you have ever heard of it. It's about 300 miles from 500 kilometers from where you're sitting. There are 42 of these antennas, and we're using this Allen telescope array to try and find some evidence that there are others out there. Now, one thing that's helped is this, the Kepler Space Telescope. This is a NASA project, and I think that this is perhaps the most interesting science experiment being run today because this little baby here, this telescope, has a very simple mission, very simple job. It's designed to answer one question. What fraction of stars have planets that are like the Earth, right? With the temperatures that would allow liquid oceans, maybe an atmosphere, habitable planets. The answer's not in, but it will be within two years. And I, you know, I'll bet you all a couple of Starbucks that we'll, uh, we'll find a cousin of the Earth within the next two years, thanks to Kepler. Here are some of the planets it's already found. It's found several thousand planetary candidates. Okay, and if that, if that number, what fraction of stars have planets like the Earth, if it comes out where we think it might, it means that that's kind of the number of other Earths, cousins of the Earth, just in our galaxy. That's a big number. And it's hard to believe that all of them are sitting there doing nothing, biologically speaking. Okay, um, why haven't we found the aliens by playing uh, this eavesdrop card? Uh, the problem is we've always in the past had to use somebody else's antenna. This is the one down in Puerto Rico. Anybody been there? Nobody's been there. Go see it. Next time you go to Puerto Rico, drive from San Juan, it's an hour and a quarter, up to see this big Arecibo telescope. It was built by Cornell University and the Army a long time ago, but it's 1,000 feet across, 305 meters. It's a big antenna. It would hold four billion scoops of Baskin Robbins. Not a good idea in the tropics. Okay, but we haven't found anything, and the reason is, the reason is that we only get to use the antennas occasionally. However, if you get nothing else out of this talk, which is entirely possible, maybe you'll get this. This is a plot they say every time you show a plot, you lose 10% of the audience. I, I have 12. Okay, so this is just a plot of the approximate speed of our SETI searches over time. So this was that first experiment that Frank Drake did back in 1960. Let's call that one, and then it's going up. Right? This is a semi-log plot for those of you who know what that means. It's going up. And the point is, it's going up exponentially. It's doubling in speed every 18 months. And the reason for that is it's dependent on computers. And computers are doubling in speed every 18 months. That's, that's an economic law of the Silicon Valley. Okay, so it's just following that law. That means we're searching faster and faster all the time. We're going through a haystack looking for needles, but we're using bigger and bigger spoons all the time. So I honestly think, whoops, I honestly think that this kind of experiment will find ET within the next two decades, the next 25 years, something like that, and I bet everybody you know, a cup of coffee, that will happen. So here's the deal for you. Either in the next 25 years, you'll pick up the newspaper, well, you won't do that. You'll open up your browser, and it'll say, scientists find signal coming from life, uh, from life in space, or, you know, you get a cup of coffee. So it's not so bad. 
pipe. Let me just finish off with some speculations about what they might be like, because everybody wants to know. If you hear somebody, who's behind the microphone? Is it going to be one of these little gray guys with the big eyeballs and no hair and no sense of humor? That could be. But again, those guys are very anthropomorphic. They look like you. In fact, <laughs> so an evolutionary biologist pointed out to me, look, that's just a projection of what we think we're going to be like in a million years. Right? Everything else is coming. You know, we're losing our dentition. We're losing our olfactory sense. Small nose, small mouth, small bodies. They don't load trucks. Right? Big eyes, because in the future, your job description will be design websites. OK, maybe. But again, they look like us. Right? I'm here to tell you they won't look like us, not just because of the biology. Looking like us means, well, they're carbon-based. Here's a periodic table of the elements. You all know that. Carbon, carbon. We're carbon-based. That's the basis of your chemistry. Not because there's so much carbon in the ground. I mean, there is a fair amount, but there's a lot more silicon, which is the next thing down there. But carbon is really good at hooking up with other atoms, other carbon atoms and so forth. It has those four covalent bonds. It's a friendly atom. These other atoms are also friendly, but not quite as friendly as carbon for various reasons. Mainly, they're bigger atoms. Silicon, you know, silicon-based life in science fiction. Germanium-based life, never heard of it. Tin-based life in The Wizard of Oz, maybe. But carbon-based, that seems like a reasonable thing. So we, we just sort of assume that ET will probably be carbon-based, and then a bunch of other things that, you know, might be true for an intelligent species. I, th I think this is important, by the way. You know, dolphins are said to be smart. I don't know. You, they don't write great literature, but okay. They're said to be smart, but they can't pick up a pair of pliers or a screwdriver, so they can't build a radio transmitter. We're never going to hear from them. I, I, so I think it's important to have something where you can you know, pick up a screwdriver. This is what we assume. In other words, we assume that the aliens will be like you. It's very self-centered, okay? But we're, we are self-centered. Uh, but what if, what if that's wrong? This is an important plot. This is, this is a plot made by Hans Morovich who's a, a roboticist, actually, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And all he did was plot how much compute power you buy for $1,000 ever since 1900. Right? So, you know, in 1900, you didn't get a whole lot of compute power for $1,000, but it's going up. Now, Morovich's plot ends in about 1997. 1997, for $1,000, you buy the compute power of a lizard. I don't know if that interests you. Today, 2012, you buy the compute power of what? A mouse. Right, still not interesting. But what is interesting is that this plot tells you that by 2020, your laptop, your desktop computer will have the same compute power as your brain. Now, that doesn't mean it can think, but that means we now have the hardware to build a device that can think as well as you can. What's going to happen in this century, the most important thing that's going to happen to humankind, I mean, several things are going to happen. I think we'll find life in space. You may think that's important or not. We're going to move out into space, some of us. That is important. And by far the most important thing is we may invent our successors. Because sometime in this century, we may get strong artificial intelligence. Here's the time scale argument. This is an important argument. We invented practical radio in 1900. So there's Marconi, OK? That, that was like 100 years ago, practical radio. In, in less than a half century, we already had computers. During the war, we had computers, right? I mean, they were big. They weren't laptops. But, but we had them. We'd invented the computer. And the expectation is that sometime in this century, somewhere between 10 and 100 years from now, we will have what's called strong artificial intelligence. Intelligence that can write the great American novel, right? That can, <laughs> I don't know, out-philosophize Goethe, whatever. That that'll happen in this century. Now, you may not believe that. There are a lot of people who think, nah. Never do it. But if I ask you, could you make an artificial heart? You'd say, well, yeah, you can do that. Artificial kitty, well, yeah, you can do that. Artificial pancreas, well, I don't know, but probably you can do that. But suddenly, if I ask you about that organ between your ears, everybody gets their hands up and they say, wait, no, that's wishful thinking. There's no miracle going on between your ears. I know you like to think so, but there really isn't. So that means that within a few centuries of inventing radio, so you make yourself known, you invent your successors. It doesn't mean they kill us, right? I, I have a gold. I have goldfish at home. I don't kill them just because I'm smarter than they are. Right? It doesn't mean anything. Okay. So I think that I'm just going to point out to you that once you do that, you change the whole game because you now give up Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution is fine. It's made you. You're okay. We we barely work, but we sort of work, right? But it's very slow and it's very unpredictable. Example: horse. 60 million years ago, horse was the size of a dog. Today, a horse is the size of a horse. 
okay. That's, that took 50 million years. I had a computer in 1977 at home, right? The computer I have at home today is 10,000 times faster than that thing, right? And that's in a few decades. So as soon as you have artificial intelligence, it completely outstrips biological intelligence. You know, 20 years after you have a thinking machine, you have a thinking machine that's smarter than all humans put together, okay? Now, you're, you're thinking, well, this is science fiction. It's not, you're gonna see it happen. You can see a lot of it happen anyhow, okay? So let me just leave with this. If we find ET, and I bet you a cup of, cup of coffee that we'll find it within your, within your lifetime, I mean, that'll be interesting news, and it'll be like Copernicus, and you know, you'll think, you know, philosophically, that's rather interesting. Because it means we're not the only kids on the block, and we're not the smartest kids on the block. We're just another duck in the row. But what I think is rather interesting is to keep in mind that whatever we find is overwhelmingly likely not to be soft and squishy the way you are, but some sort of deliberately constructed intelligence. Okay, well, I'll stop there in case any questions.